people take a lot of pride in being able to pay for the product. And so I think that any pushback we had in the beginning was definitely overwhelmingly uh, changed by the fact that people want to pay for their product and they take big ownership yep. and so much just so much pride and so much happiness and knowing that they paid it back. And it might have taken them 10 months, but they did it and they own it and it is theirs. What's up, damn givers? Welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. I'm your host, Nick LaPara, and as always, we're bringing you the stories of people who saw something wrong in the world and gave a damn about it. This conversation is no exception. Today, my guest is my friend and superwoman, Molly Burke. Molly is the CEO and co-founder of Cycle Connect, a company that connects clients in Northern Uganda with the necessary tools to propel themselves forward out of extreme poverty. They do this through giving their clients the opportunity to continuously invest in their futures through Cycle Connect's portfolio of products that are proven to increase income. She'll explain more about what the hell this actually means during our chat, of course. Molly leads a team of 30 full-time employees that serve over 5,000 clients in Northern Uganda. It's an incredible organization doing so much good. Molly splits her time between Brooklyn, New York and Uganda. An amazing woman. Friends, you're going to love this conversation. And I'm so confident that I'll give you a money back guarantee that you're going to learn a thing or two about giving a damn from Molly. Get it? You know, because this whole thing is free for you. Anyway, stupid lame joke. That is a dad joke. Sorry about that. Let's get right into this, my friends. Here's my conversation with amazing human and the CEO of Cycle Connect, Molly Burke. Molly Burke, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's great to be here. Good. We have been planning this for quite some time. Uh, we had a, a like a Skype chat a few months ago. Mm -hmm. We were introduced to each other, and I loved our conversation. I loved everything that you we talked about in your work, and so I'm very excited to now get to know way more of the story because I don't know it all. Um, so thank you for coming. Let's begin by you sharing uh, some of your story, right, before we get to the work that you're doing, which is hugely important, and I have so many questions. Um, let's talk first about where you came from. Uh, who are the people that influenced you? Different things that stick out from your growing up years that might give us a peek into uh, why you are the way that you are and who you are today. Mm -hmm. So I guess when I think about who I am today, I guess I go a bit backwards. So if it's cool with you, I'll just start because I feel like where I am today in been living in Uganda for the past four to five years has shaped me so much. Mm. But of course, at the core, it comes down to family, friends, and where I grew up. But I think that who I am today, I guess, has softened some of the edges mm. on, you know, on the choices that I've made, or I guess my attitude and the pace of life. So living in Uganda has just really taken that rigid, I guess, attitude or just push for pace that happens when you live in New York and then when you live in a country where anything goes, um, it really softens it. So I feel like I grew up in a household that was incredibly supportive and really loving parents and a wonderful brother. And that helped me become the person who I was when I moved to Uganda and then living in Uganda where, like I said, anything goes uh, just means that you put things into different perspective. And I guess, especially living there in um, my mid to late 20s, early 30s, such a formative time in your life. Yeah. Um, that um, is a huge aspect of who I am and who I, I think will continue to be. And then, of course, at the core, um, I think two other aspects that have shaped me are, like I said, my family, incredibly supportive. Um, my parents, my brother, uh, my extended family. My dad's one of 10. And so living out in... Um, growing up in Minnesota where he grew up and then having um, such a big family and network uh, meant that I just feel like I was incredibly lucky. And so talk about, you know, different lifestyle as far as growing up first, um, what I'm living today. But I think all along, the constant denominator has been this amazing community and network. Wait, so Minnesota is different than New York and Uganda? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did we connect about Minnesota? I can't remember our conversation. We talked about Minnesota, right? Pro I, I don't there know. For Probably four years. Yeah, yeah. Were, were you 
was it in Minneapolis or elsewhere in the state? Um, so they are kind of spread throughout uh, Twin Cities as okay. well as um, southern areas, so Mankato, um, thereabouts. Yeah. In that. So he grew up in a really small farming town called Janesville. Um, and then so... Uh, I have no idea where that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Near, near, near Mankato. Near somewhere. There's like a yeah. tree and a hill. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, and then so the farm stayed in the family and then it became... Um, a hog farm, and so um, a couple of my uncles still run that, and so that, I guess, so Minnesota and the Midwest has been the community as far as um, the Burke family, and so even though, you know, I grew up in New York, um, we still continue to, I guess, that was the center of gravity. Okay, so when, yeah, you said you grew up in New York, you were here all your life, like from birth, you were born here? Yeah, yeah, okay. outside of New York. Yeah, yeah. got it. Yeah. Got it. When does Uganda come into play and why, right? So you're, you've got Minnesota, New York roots. Uh, yeah, why Uganda? How did that come about? Um, so I was, I was in college um, and I was active, I guess, in you know, social sector um, things, different clubs, different organizations. And one of my friends in that time was a Ugandan student and he came up with an idea for a project uh, that would take place in Uganda. And so I was intrigued. And so I got involved with that club, that student organization. And I guess it was just kind of um, fell into place after that. So uh, he was able to secure a grant from Clinton Global Initiative University. And then a bunch of students went over to Uganda. And I think at that point, I was just really intrigued and you know, just absolutely fell in love with the country and the people and the place and just saw so much opportunity um, and so from there, it just kind of took off. I finished college, I got a job in New York, and then ultimately, uh, I decided to leave that job and focus on running the organization full time. Let's talk about that organization. Uh, and first, so what, what year are we talking about? When are you first in Uganda? Like how long has mm -hmm. it been a part of your life? Yeah. So I first visited in 2009. Okay. Um, so 10 years ago, a decade ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Exactly. Almost exactly a decade ago. July, 2009 is when we first uh, when we first did our trip. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's talk about uh, Cycle Connect. Where did the idea come from? How did it come to fruition? Uh, and then we'll, we'll, get way, we'll get more into it after you finish that part. Yeah. So Moyambi, our founder of the organization, a friend of mine from Uganda, he originally came up with the organization. This is the, the person you originally went with on the trip, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he grew up in Uganda and he grew up in a really remote part of the country and uh, very modest background as far as his family. And he went through government schools his whole life. And so because of that, he was able to get a scholarship to go to a school in Norway to finish the last two years of high school. And so I guess not only because he went to public schools, but also because obviously he's very smart and he tested well and he was picked up on the national scale. Um, and so he was able to go to Norway and then the same scholarship brought him to the US uh, to go to college at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, which is where he and I met. Um, so I guess there was a little bit of a mostly New York, my upbringing, and then um, went off to uh, Central PA for college. And Moyambi just had experiences growing up where he was in this remote part of the country in Rukunjiri in the Southwest of Uganda and his family didn't have a bicycle in their home. They couldn't necessarily afford one at that time. And so therefore, when you live in these far out places, if you need to go to the health center, if you need to go to the market to trade your goods to make some money, you need clean water, you need to go to school, you either walk, which can be hours, or you might take a motorcycle taxi um, and then spend a week's or a month's worth of wages, uh, depending on um, depending on how far you're going and you know how critical the resource is. And so, between those two different alternatives, I guess a third alternative is having a bicycle. But if you don't have a bicycle, you have to rely on the other two, or you have to try to find a bicycle somewhere in the community, a neighbor or some other lucky person who has it, and then get to the health center, get to the market. And so Moyambi really relied on his neighbors yeah. to be able to get to the health center um, in times of need, when he got malaria or when another family member was sick. He went to, you said Norway mm -hmm. for school, and then he came to the U.S. What, 
because because he's not here, I want to I want to ask you a little bit about him. A lot of people think, you know, when you when a lot of these immigrants come to the U.S., right, that they just are here to consume and take, right? And here's someone who came and had his mind on helping his people, right? He was <laughs> saying, I need to help them and, and go back and start this thing. So uh, how did you, what, what were you observing from him that was like, yeah, I wanna work, I wanna work with him. Mm -hmm. I, wanna, I wanna help him with this thing. I wanna start this thing with him. What was it about him? He takes so much pride and passion mm. in being a Ugandan. And he's often said that he's, he's in the States right now, but he wants to move back. And he makes a point to go back every single year. Whereas I think that, you know, I have many friends um, who are, have, you know, immigrated to the U.S. or who came yeah. over for college. And then they might not go back for 10 years, whereas he really makes a point um, to go back every single year. He's resisted things like adjusting his accent. I mean, he takes so much yeah. pride. He's Ugandan through <laughs> yeah. and through. Yeah. So I think that that aspect as well as, I mean, it was one of those moments. I remember when he was first telling telling a group of us about this idea that he had. And it was one of those moments where you could just sell, tell that there's something in his head and it, he couldn't really clearly communicate it, which I feel like is <laughs> sort of, you know, an example of somebody who has so much passion, has this big, big idea um, and is having, you know, the difficulty in translating just how transformative it could be. And honestly, I don't think I even realized until I went to Uganda and could see just really how transformative bicycles are and being able to help those who are living in the last mile get to these basic life needs. Yeah. So do, uh, do us a favor, kind of explain what you all offer then, right? So mm -hmm. I think people get the vision and obviously bikes are something, transportation, but having multiple uh, ways to get from A to B is something we take for granted here, right? Mm -hmm. Like even the poorest people in New York, where we are right now, can get on a subway and ride it as far, you know, they can get places for a little bit of money or someone will help them, you know, get on the train or yeah, or bicycles, scooters. Like there's just so many ways to get around. And we take that for granted, right? That some people have to walk, you know, I do some work with World Vision and yeah, the, the stats on how, you know, how much school kids are missing because they have to walk to go get like shitty water that is gonna probably harm them, but it's water and we need water to live. And they walk hours a day to get a bucket of water, right? And so, yeah, okay, so we get bicycles, which is super cool. But like, what, how do you, how does that happen? Are there, are there programs, products, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at Cycle Connect, uh, the organization that I lead, the one that Moyambi originally came up with the idea for, we offer asset financing for farmers. And so what that means is that we're providing products such as a bicycle to those living in these deep rural areas, uh, mostly farmers, and then they get to use these products, so like a bike, to be able to yeah. increase their income and they pay us back over time. And so we originally started off doing bikes because of Moyambi and because he he wanted to make sure that Ugandans could get access to bikes and it felt like a bang for your buck. Um, and then we saw that there's need for more of this, that financial institutions in these areas aren't servicing the last mile customers and they're certainly not servicing the farmers who are in most need. Three quarters of the Ugandan population are not being serviced by financial institutions. And so we saw this market gap and we saw the fact that this is last mile in terms of distance, but it's also last mile in terms of market gap and the opportunity there. And so that's where we stepped in and we decided to offer oxen and plows so that people can till and harvest their land uh, much more effectively. Uh, grinding machines so that they can then take their maize and make it into flour. Motorcycles so that they can have an even larger uh, distance to reach when in need. And we're testing other products to be able to help farmers in, uh, in further ways to be able to help throughout the value chain. How do the people that you've been able, you all have been able to help, how do they respond? I assume some of them at some point in their life, because they live maybe in the places they do, they've had other white people typically come in and give them things. And then you come in and say, uh, we're not gonna give it to you. You'll pay us back. Here's, here's the arrangement. We wanna help you. We wanna support you. What is the response? Do you get people that are like, I want it for free? Mm -hmm. Or is the general response, which I think I know the answer to this. Yeah, what is the general response from mm -hmm. people? So, okay, the, I should add some context. We're working Please. in northern Uganda, which is the place, um, I guess, Gulu specifically, which is where there was a civil war for about 20 years. And so 
This is the reason why Moyambi chose Northern Uganda. He grew up in the Southwest, and yet he had visited Northern Uganda shortly after the war had ended and decided that business opportunities could go a really long way in this particular area, that there was a lot of NGOs. You walk down the street, and there are so many different NGOs, and he wanted something to complement them. Mm. And so, therefore, I would say in the beginning that there was a little bit of pushback, I think particularly because of our original name, Bicycles Against Poverty. And we transitioned, uh, we rebranded to Cycle Connect. But as Bicycles Against Poverty, I think that you have that connotation of it sounds like a nonprofit, it sounds like an NGO. Um, But ultimately, people take a lot of pride in being able to pay for the product. And so I think that any pushback we had in the beginning was definitely overwhelmingly uh, changed by the fact that people want to pay for their product and they take big ownership and so much just so much pride and so much happiness in knowing that they paid it back. And it might have taken them 10 months, but they did it and they own it and it is theirs. And that's also what we saw when we were transitioning to add other products. We kept hearing from our clients, we want other products. We don't want you to give them to us but we want the ability to pay them back over time because nobody else is willing to take a risk on us. And so that aspect of them saying, we want to be able to effectively borrow um, is huge. And they weren't asking for something for free. Yeah. No, I think that's super key. I was hoping you would get there. Uh, You know, that's another misconception with, you know, people live in poverty here and abroad, uh, homeless people, is that they're looking to take advantage of people. They're looking to get everything for free. I think it's part of our human nature to want to work for what we do. Work is good. It makes us feel good. That feeling of like at the end of the day, you're like you're tired, but it's like a good tired because I worked. Now I can provide for my, my people, right? And so that's what I assumed was happening, especially, I mean, I haven't been to Uganda. I've been to Zambia. I've been to, you know, dozens of countries at this point. And what I encounter most of the time is people not wanting uh, the handout. They want to work for what they do. Um, so... Give me some numbers. What What is the impact of what you all are doing? How many, for, for example, maybe how many loans have you been able to give out for, you know, the bikes, the motorcycles, grinding machines? Um, mm-hmm. What else? Um, there was one more thing. Oxen plow. There you go. Oxen <laughs> plow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, okay, the, the numbers. Um, we've... Uh, dispersed over 5,000 loans to date. Um, Each bicycle loan and most of the other products impact about five people, which means that we have affected 25,000 Ugandans since we first began. We're also focused on increasing income, and so that's the products that we choose. And so each product increases income by at least 30%. And so what you see is that with a bicycle, they increase market access. They're tripling their market access. They're going five times the distance, and they're taking four times the amount of good on the back of that bicycle on the carrier. You see oxen and plow, they're able to move from doing one acre to two, three acres, and they're also able to cut down on hand-tilling their land taking a couple of weeks to a couple of days. And so through that, these products are transformational. They're really transformational, and we're moving from 5,000 products. By the end of this fiscal year, in the next 12 months, we'll be reaching 9,000 Ugandans. So we're going to do another 4,000 in the next 12 months and then continue to scale and grow from there. That's really beautiful. Are you one of the founders? Sorry. You're one of oh, the founders. I'm a, yeah, I joined Moyambi early on, so I'm a yeah, co-founder in co-founder, it. co-founder, yeah. Besides you two, what does the team look like? How, how does that work? Because I know that you, we just, right before the mics went on, you just got back Friday from being there two months. You're kind of back and forth between Brooklyn and Uganda. So what does the team look like? How do you guys work together? Um, yeah, I moved to Uganda five years ago, almost to the week. So five years after our initial student organization had our wow. first distribution. And so that's when we really moved from, I guess, a project into an actual operational organization. Sure. And uh, over that time, we've added about 25 full-time team members. And so we have our 25 full-time team members are supporting those several thousand clients on a day-to-day basis. And so that means that most folks are out in the field. And so we have our Ugandan team leader, a man named Fred Agrikinchu, who's in charge of about 15 field officers. And he's helping to lead the credit portfolio, push out the sales, make sure that the training is in place and really supporting the community. Um, And then we have other people who are in charge of back-end finances or back-end operations. Um, And then we also are now hiring for a country director to take my place uh, as I look to transition from going 
full time there to, as you mentioned, back and forth. Yeah. We're kind of shifting from talking about Cycle Connect to we want to learn from you. Um, you've been doing this for years now, and there are so many people that have ideas like this or want to run organizations like this. What are some of the struggles that you have had in the past five years full time as an organization? I guess even before that, I left my job two years before I moved to Uganda, and I was trying to do it full time and also just basically hustling, working other part time yeah. jobs, you know, working in nursery school, working at, you know, doing events and all these different things. And I ended up moving to Uganda for for reasons that were not necessarily directly related to taking the organization to the next level. It was really budgetary reasons that I could survive on a stipend in Uganda, whereas I couldn't survive on a stipend in New York. And so I think that it's so backwards. Like it's so yeah. crazy backwards yeah. to think that I'm going to move there in order to do that. Whereas at the end of the day, I mean, that's really when things took off. That's when we had our first full-time team member. That's when we had our first full-time office. And so I guess as people are starting to think about it, you got to immerse yourself in the culture. You got to really be there. And this idea of say running something from the States from the get-go I think is incredibly challenging and I just don't understand. I think that some people have been successful with it, but by and large, really immersing yourself into it, understanding what makes your team tick, really understanding how to build systems and build capacity. And it changes at each different level. So the way that our systems or anything was set up five years ago to where it is today is just transformational. And so you have to be there in order to understand how to adapt, how to iterate, and then how to help you and your organization grow. I've done a lot of similar work to what you're doing, at least in the same spaces. And I'm wondering if you have had any moments of burnout or if you have paced yourself pretty well uh, throughout these last few years of, you know, living in two different countries, going back and forth, and just all the craziness of running an organization like this. Have you experienced burnout or are you a much better person than me? <laughs> um, yeah, as far as the challenges, um, so I guess going back to that, um, aside from not being in Uganda, um, yeah, work-life balance, I'm not really good at it. And I think that I've gotten better at it. I took um, three and a half weeks off a couple of months ago. And so that was a big step. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm really trying to make sure that I take more time, but I'm really not good at it. And I think that that is a huge fault. And I don't know how to tell people to get better other than, you know, if you don't plan those days off, then it's going to really come to bite you at the end. And so it took several years for me to take two weeks off. And I think I did it once. And then I just took three and a half weeks off. And I wish it was six because we need to be able to replenish. And we need to be able to rest. And you work hard, but you should also rest hard. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what have you learned as you become, uh, I'm not saying you weren't a leader before this organization, but as you become a better leader, uh, naturally just leading a team of 25 and, and leading that way, what have you learned about uh, leadership um, over the last few years? Now a team of a couple dozen. I guess there's a couple of different things that I've learned. And I think that I would say that I'm very much still learning and very much still in that. I don't know. I feel like a student phase of this, sure. but um, the, you know, continuing to have a curiosity to curiosity so that you can help those who are looking for their own solution rather than tell them their own solution. So how to influence and coach rather than necessarily direct. And I think there's a fine line between knowing which one is the right call to make in the moment, particularly as you are capacity building. Um, and so sometimes it's really hard to coach people to the right answer. But I would say that, yeah, part of leadership is allowing people to make those mistakes and, um, and then also supporting them, perhaps putting up the guardrails and not necessarily saying do this, this, and this, but really guiding them to that process. And so I think that that's just a huge aspect that I've had to learn and I definitely am still fully in it. Because as an entrepreneur, you're just used to doing it. Yep. You just want to go, go, go. And so you see this problem, you want to fix it. But that's not the most sustainable way to do it, no. especially when you're coming in as a foreigner and especially when you want to be able to make sure that the organization and the team and especially the national team is sustainable and they're becoming effective leaders. What are a couple of the hardest things you had to get used to moving to Uganda from the U.S.? Were there any like practical ones or hard ones or funny ones? Just what were the things that you had to say, well, that's different 
this is the way they are. This is now the way I am. Oh, man, I feel like I have so many in my pocket, and it's going to be about <laughs> whether I can find the right ones. Sure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that aspect of in the beginning, how it shaped me, you come from New York, and then you have this whole go, go, go lifestyle, and it's really just I have to go here, and then I have to go here, and, you know, if I'm a minute late, that really makes a big difference, whereas time is relative, and especially in – and I think that it's just – it's funny to think about it because you go out to the villages – um, in Uganda, where where our clients are, and they don't necessarily they don't have watches. They just look at the sun. Yep. And so they'll say six a.m., but really it's just when the sun rises. Um, and so I think that that aspect of time. I mean, it's so cliche, but that aspect of time was definitely something that I had to get used to. But it pushes you to become adaptable because it's not just time; it's kind of everything. You know, things don't fall into place, um, and you you can work so hard on spinning your wheels. And so you're just going to spin your wheels and you're just going to, you know, like get upset in the yeah. process. Um, so, yeah, I guess that would be that's kind of like the the high level. Um, but I should I should also add some context that I've been living in a more field city. So um, not a whole lot of amenities. So you end up um, you end up finding certain ways to make pad thai by getting tamarind and soaking them and then, you know, making Making, yeah. I don't know, the cooking aspect has been um, incredibly unique. You just find all these different hacks for how you can try to have the different comfort foods or comfort amenities that you'd have in the States. So I guess I, I feel like I got good at packing my suitcase with Trader Joe's <laughs> amenities Yeah. Um, yeah. over the past couple the of years. The goodies that you need to get through you know, mm-hmm. the next season of life. I, I've lived overseas for 13 or 14 years of my life, and I know that very well. Like, especially when we were younger and only coming back every so often with my family. It, yeah, when we left, it was all those things that were, we, we, you know, we knew where we were going. Shopping's different. Everything's different. But let's take a, a little bit of the, the comfort, mm-hmm. the comfort of home so that we uh, have those things. Just shoot for the stars for a second. What, uh, what's the future of Cycle Connect? Like, I know you said 4,000 loans in the next year. But do you guys want to add, you know, different products and programs? Like, what what would be the ideal reach, you know, effect of your work um, if you if you guys do well and dream well? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I really believe that what we're building is a model that will be replicated through other entities. And so, how can we work, say, with an agribusiness who's trying to lend to smallholder farmers so that they can then purchase more? cotton or sure. purchase more it sesame. benefits everybody. Yeah. And then so if, if that agribusiness is trying to reach farmers so that they can purchase more from them, sometimes the farmers can't, can't necessarily provide the fastest turnaround or they don't have the capital to be able to produce what the agribusiness needs. And so if we can step in there and we can be that lending partner so that the agribusiness or the other organizations can learn how to best responsibly lend to the to the farmers and thus increase their income, then that's ultimately what we're focused on. And so replicating our model means that by 2033, in the next 14 years, we want to reach 1 million customers per year. We want to be operating throughout the East African region. We'll have scaled throughout Uganda and we'll have expanded into other countries all through the distribution and all through the replication of other partners and other ecosystem actors. That's amazing. One million customers per month. That would be that would be truly, truly amazing. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Was this? Are you anywhere near it? Do you remember what you wanted to be when you grew up? I always think about yeah, what I wanted to yeah, be, yeah. and it's like totally different, you know. Because we have, you know, sometimes kids are like astronaut or you know uh, ballerina or whatever. So what was what was yours? So I was a soccer player. So I wanted to be Mia Hamm when I was probably 10, 10, 11 years old, um, and then. Uh, I got into running because I was into soccer and found out that I was a better runner than I would be a soccer player. And uh, and then so I had an injury at the end of my high school uh, running time and, and I was going into college. And so I decided that I wanted to be in sports medicine and my father was a doctor. And so I really thought that this is the pathway for me. And I definitely got a couple of C's in science and so quickly pivoted. Yeah. Um, but really sports and medicine were a lot of my focus, not necessarily because I was interested in medicine, but because I guess it's sort of, you just hear these things of doctors, lawyers, you know, this is what drives success. And so I guess it just sort of felt like 
that's what I'm going to go towards. And I really like sports. Um, and then, yeah, didn't, didn't do too well, not really that into science and, uh, found myself being really, really passionate about environmental and social issues as I was, you know, getting these C's or so in, um, in the biology or chemistry classes, I then saw this opportunity of how do we then work on these different social issues. And I was interested in the business side of it too. Yeah, that's really cool. Going back a couple minutes to when you were talking about, you know, I asked you some of the challenges. I spent six weeks in Zambia and I remember, I'm a big city guy. You obviously love, you know, the big cities. I remember so distinctly having to, um, while you were saying that all these like memories were coming flooding back, uh, on both things, the time and the getting really creative. We, I, so I lived, it wasn't in Lusaka, it wasn't near the big city, it was way like five hours out into the middle of nowhere. But I mean, back then there weren't even iPhones anyway, but there was no, it was, it was the book I had in my hand. Um, and you know, we just, we, we got very creative with the food and I spent six weeks out there. And I remember at one event that we were doing out there, this was like a, like a, a Christian mission thing back then. And one of the events that we were doing, uh, they rang a bell, really loud bell, and that let everybody know from as far as the bell could, you know, reach, start coming this way. So that was like a, it was actually like a two hour, we weren't going to start for two oh, hours. Wow. It was like, because again, it was a very like loud bell, but that was like the, hey, so yeah, it was almost two hours later that we actually started because that was just like, okay, now, you know, make your way here. And I remember, again, maybe I would think differently if I were in that situation because now we're so like infected with, you know, so many, uh, you know, so many different kinds of communication hitting us every day and we have our phones. And that wasn't the case back then. But still, I went through a period where I was, you know, having the shakes and, you know, like I can't do anything out here. It literally, there's nothing for miles and miles and miles unless we get in all the trucks and head for 30, 40 miles away. But then three, four weeks into it, I, well, I resigned to it, and I felt so much better. I felt so much better about the silence, about walking outside the compound and going on adventures and not really having uh, an end goal in mind, just like going. And so I loved that. I loved that you pointed that out. I loved that you also didn't, you know, pr there's probably some resisting, but you saw as like, this is necessary for me to, you know, if I'm going to stay here long term and love these people and love the culture... I have to become, at least here, maybe not in New York, that, that wouldn't fly very well in New York, not paying attention to time and all of that. But um, yeah, those are really beautiful things that I hope more people get to experience. I hope, I'm always encouraging people like travel, 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 and don't travel as a, you know, with a white savior complex thinking you're going to go fix people, but travel, get into, get into these different cultures because it's, it's utterly life-changing, right? I assume you are completely different and we'll never know, but if you had just gone on your career path, maybe doing something in sports and medicine, maybe not the medicine part, but um, you know, you wouldn't have the amount of empathy, the amount of vision that you have today. Um, so that's really, really cool. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about your life or Cycle Connect that you want to tell us about, want to communicate? Uh, I just want to make sure that we get as much of your story out there as possible. I want people to get excited about what you all are doing. I don't know. I'm much better talking about Cycle Connect than I am about myself. So um, well, we're highlighting more than more than Cycle Connect. We're highlighting you. That's what this whole podcast is about. And so, um, yeah, if there's anything you want to share, anything you're struggling with that might help people, anything you are winning at that you think might help people, that would encourage them to like keep going. Um, I just want to make sure we get it all in. I want to give you an opportunity to share. You don't have to have anything, mm -hmm. obviously. I guess what I'm struggling at and what I feel like I'm winning at um, are maybe the same thing as far as the growth in our team and then just seeing that this organization is so much bigger than where, so much bigger, and this sounds, this sounds bad to say, but it's so much bigger than me. And I think that that's probably the most, that's the proudest moment that I've had yeah. in that there's people running specific departments and we have people who have huge potential, not only in the organization at Cycle Connect, but really in their entire careers. And so I think that that's really amazing to see. We just had a rebrand. We changed from Bicycles Against Poverty to Cycle Connect. Um, I didn't really touch too much of the process because our communications manager was so adept at being able to get it done. Our credit performance and our sales, our sales goals are really run by our regional manager, um, Fred Kintu. And so I think that 
being inspired by those who work and lead the organization has been something that I've worked towards for so long. And then at the same time, you know, it makes you think of how necessary am I? And so I'm going through a particular process of reflecting on what is my role? And it's no longer day to day, but how do I help these individuals? How do I help Fred? How do I help Morgan? How do I help Hope? How do I help all the other people who lead our organization be able to then do their job better and know that um, I can still lead, but also really I'm much more in a supportive role because their ideas and their contributions are so incredibly powerful. You should feel very proud that you can now do 70% here and 30% there and the team still runs. That's not, that's not a given with starting a company, right? It's not a given that you, in fact, most companies, I would guess, if those leading, whether in a manager, director, or founder sort of role, if they step out, I know situations, I've seen it happen where everything just kind of falls apart, people don't work as effectively, they slack off, and so the, the fact that you're going to grow next year without you being there, I mean, you should be proud of that. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really, really cool thing. Last question, someday you are going to die. Hopefully it's so many years from now, but death is on the calendar for all of us at some point. And um, on that day, your friends and your family, Cycle Connect employees, all the people that you have been able to impact and lead and serve over your lifetime are there to celebrate and mourn your life. And the hypothetical part of this is that I got chosen to give your eulogy, which won't happen. Maybe it'll happen. Who knows? Um, what do you hope that I would say on that day about your life and legacy? So I think that I care so much about the people around me, but I don't necessarily do the best job of telling them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that some of my actions may speak that, and then some of my words or maybe lack thereof don't necessarily do that. And so I hope that I'll grow into that over time. And so I guess what I would say is that um, she invested fully in those around her and and so I think that's a token to how I feel because I really do believe in the potential of not only my teammates, but my friends and my partner and my family. Um, and so I just want to be able to continue to do a better job of, I guess, continuing to invest and really show them how much I care. And like I said, just everybody, you know, friends, family, personal, professional. Um, it's just so important to me that people can feel that they're valued and people can feel like they're contributing and they're able to realize their full potential emotionally and I guess as far as um, their work as well. That would be a wonderful life and legacy to leave. Um, I encourage you to continue <laughs> down that path. Where can people find out more about you and about Cycle Connect? What do you, what's the call to action here at the very end? Yeah, check us out. We are uh, Cycle Connect. So our handle is Cycle Connect. Our website is www.cycleconnect.org. If you want to throw a donation our way and be able to help us achieve the 4,000 clients that we're looking to serve in this next 12 months, uh, head over that way and you can help us out there. You can follow us on social media as well, at Cycle Connect. So sharing that if people can donate, I want to give, if we can real quickly before we actually shut down, you know, sometimes you can, like if people are giving gifts, you can say, Hey, three, three donations of whatever gets, you know, a bicycle loan, whatever, like, um, what would it cost? What does it cost to, uh, give somebody a bicycle on loan and all of that? Like, how does that work? Yeah. So a bike is around a hundred dollars, oxen and plow around $400. And so we have varying different products of varying different costs. But I'd say as far as what we see that, uh, the, the largest impact, it's really around that one to $500. So getting bikes in the hands of Ugandans or uh, helping farmers be able to till their land. Really, you have an ability to be able to impact that in a pretty direct way. It's really beautiful. Molly Burke, thank you so much for joining us today. This was awesome. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, this is fun. Friends, I really enjoyed this chat with Molly Burke. I hope you did too. I hope you feel encouraged and I hope you feel challenged. If you have any questions or thoughts about this conversation, I'm always available to chat on social media at Nick LaPara or at Let's Give a Damn, or you can shoot me an email at hello at letsgiveadam.com. As always, you can find links and more information about this podcast conversation and all things Let's Give a Damn by going to, you guessed it, letsgiveadam.com. If you love what we're doing on the show, please, please, please tell a friend. 
we grow by word of mouth. I hear feedback all the time on social media and in emails that I get that someone told someone about this and now they're listening, now they're involved in our community. So tell a friend, maybe leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or consider throwing a few dollars our way each month to support the production of this show by going to patreon.com slash let's give a damn right now. This podcast episode was created by Chad Snavely and yours truly. The music is by our friend, Propaganda. Next week, a brilliant conversation with my friend, Dan Simpson, the CEO of the Mediterranean Cafe Tzatziki's, 92 locations, 2,000 employees. And boy, does he give a damn and that company give a damn. Don't miss it. Love y'all. Peace. Peace.